Evening time, we do have outbreaks of showery rain, sleet and some hill snow across northern England, spreading into Scotland, parts of Northern Ireland and some western fringes of Wales too. Elsewhere, we'll see some clear spells and as temperatures drop overnight, we'll see some mist and fog patches forming, some icy stretches too, temperatures in the countryside, minus two to minus five Celsius. So could be some tricky travelling conditions across central southern parts of England first thing, dense fog patches, but they slowly lift and break. And then for most, it's a bright and Cheery day, plenty of sunny spells, a scattering of showers across western parts of the UK and this weather front close to the east could give some patchy rain along the east coast. Temperatures up a little bit compared to Saturday, a bit more brightness around. It will just feel a little less cold. Then into Monday, this weather system starts to move into western areas, bringing some outbreaks of heavy rain and brisk winds too. Elsewhere, a cold, frosty start, but then plenty of sunshine across the north and the east through the day, and temperatures a little higher once more. It remains mixed Tuesday and towards the middle of the week, but temperatures a little above average. See you soon. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Yeah, so describe, so, the con describe the contents of the letter for us, because it is quite strongly worded, isn't it? And it suggests that your property is empty. Is. And what do they suggest yeah. is, it's going to be used for? They, they say, as part of this process, North Northamptonshire Council is identifying empty properties and sites within the area with the aim of encouraging owners to bring premises back into use or to find alternative options for derelict sites. The resettlement team in North Northamptonshire Council supports asylum seekers and refugees across three different projects, Homes for Ukraine, Afghan resettlement and asylum dispersal. At present, we are seeing a considerable increase in positive immigration decisions being made in favour of asylum seekers. So basically, they, they're wanting accommodation. But who goes around and assesses whether these properties are lived in or they are actually empty? Clearly, Ted, no, no one had bothered to come and look at your house at all, had they? What do you want now? Because clearly you are both very shaken by this letter uh, and that, that letter that you received in response has not gone far enough. Do you want an apology? What, what more do you want to see? Well, she said here that she's, you know, I sincerely apologise, this Lindsay Bell Chambers. But I don't see... There was no explanation as to how they've come to say this property was empty, whether it was disused, whether it was unkempt... Or what? If you go back through the history of the property, it's it's not been empty. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good evening, how are you? It's nine o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight and your perfect Saturday night in. In my big opinion, after number 10 step in to condemn the move, I'll be giving my first on-air reaction to the London theatre shutting people out based upon their skin colour. My Mark Meets guests are two of Britain's leading private detectives, tracking down love cheats and crooks. What goes on inside a real detective agency? 
Has Britain fallen into the hands of extremists? I'll be asking Britain's best-known political double act, The Hamiltons. Plus, following rumours that he's sent flirty messages to a colleague, I'll ask Neil and Christine, is Spice Girl Jerry Halliwell right to stand by her man? And in my take a 10, Prince Harry has lost his case against the Home Office for royal protection when he's in the UK. I'll be giving my verdict on whether the prodigal prince should have the same security as his brother William. Two hours of big opinion, big debate and big entertainment. It is Saturday night. You've worked hard all week, so you want to relax now, have a bit of a challenge, a few ideas bouncing around, maybe a couple of drinks, crack open a beer, a glass of wine, or fire up the kettle and tear open those custard creams or jammy dodgers, and let's get to work. Two big hours, don't go anywhere. First, the news headlines and Tatiana Sanchez. Mark, thank you. Your top stories from the GB Newsroom. Dozens of pro-Palestine marchers took to the streets across Britain today after the Prime Minister called on organisers not to let extremists hijack protests. In a speech last night, Rishi Sunak called for the nation to unite and said Islamist extremists and far-right groups are spreading poison. That followed George Galloway's controversial win in the Rochdale by-election this week, which the Prime Minister described as beyond alarming. The U.S. military has carried out its first airdrop of aid into Gaza. The operation, carried out jointly with Jordan's Air Force, comes after the deaths of Palestinians queuing for food, which brought renewed attention to the growing humanitarian catastrophe. President Biden says he hopes to see a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas before the start of Ramadan on the 10th of March. The retirement of 30 jets that were used to protect British skies from potential attacks has been likened to scrapping spitfires before the Battle of Britain. RAF bosses are grounding the fleet of typhoons in an effort to save a reported £300 million, despite only completing 40% of their predicted flying hours. This comes as the Defence Secretary has urged the Chancellor to increase military spending to 2.5% of GDP, something Jeremy Hunt says won't be in the budget. Towns within commuting distance of major cities have seen some of the biggest rent rises in recent years. Newly published research by property website Zoopla shows that rents have risen by more than a third in some towns. Bolton, Newport and Bradford have seen sharp increases. They're all within a short commuting distance from major cities. The company also says that while city rents are rising fastest, affordability pressures are pushing more people further out. Police are still investigating after three people were left injured in a shooting in South London, a warning of flashing images coming up. Two women were hit by shotgun pellets after a suspect dropped a firearm during a police pursuit in Clapham. A third person, who was a 27-year-old pedestrian, was injured by the moped itself when it crashed. They've all now been released from hospital. Police are still trying to find the suspects. And some royal news to finish the bulletin. Queen Camilla will take a break from official duties after leading the monarchy in public since the king's cancer diagnosis. It's understood she'll spend a few days of private downtime with the king and with her own family. Her Majesty will resume engagements on the 11th of March when she'll represent the king and lead the royal family for the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey. King Charles has withdrawn from public duties while he undergoes treatment for prostate cancer, but is continuing his work on his red boxes and other state duties in private. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen, or you can go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Mark. Great to have my old buddy Tatiana Sanchez with me on a Saturday night. She returns in an hour's time. Welcome to a very busy Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, after number 10 step in to condemn the move, I'll be giving my first on-air reaction to the London theatre, shutting people out based upon their skin colour. Has Britain fallen into the hands of extremists? I'll be asking Britain's best-known political double act, The Hamiltons. Plus, following rumours that he sent flirty messages to a colleague, I'll ask Neil and Christine, is Spice Girl Jerry Halliwell right to stand by her man? 
My Mark meets guests are two of Britain's leading private detectives, tracking down love cheats and crooks. What goes on inside a real detective agency? And in my take at 10, Prince Harry has lost his case against the Home Office for royal protection when he's in the UK. I'll be giving my verdict on whether the prodigal prince should have the same security as a serving royal. Also tonight, Queen Camilla gets a well-deserved break and a possible new role for Prince Andrew. Meanwhile, Joe Biden has another senior moment or two. We'll get reaction from the Queen of US at Showbiz Royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. We've got tomorrow's front pages at 10.30 in the company of three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, political commentator Rebecca Jane, author and journalist Benedict Spence and broadcaster and anarchist Dr Lisa McKenzie. This show is always anarchy. Plus, is antidepressant medication a scam? I'll be asking a top expert who says popping the pills isn't always the answer. Plus, the most important part of the show, your emails, they come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. And this show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. A big two hours to come, we start with my big opinion. Remember the good old days when racism and segregation were bad? The London production of a hit US theatre show called Slave Play will hold two so-called blackout performances exclusively for an all-black identifying audience. Set on a plantation in the old American South, the award-winning play explores race, identity and sexuality. Well, I'll be honest, I look forward to seeing the show on one of the light nights when uh, maybe I'm actually allowed to go. How many mental gymnastics do you have to go through to reach the conclusion that segregating people based upon the colour of their skin is somehow the best way to tackle racism? I would humbly suggest it's like tackling a forest fire with unleaded petrol. Now, clearly, there are people of ethnic backgrounds who do not participate enough in live theatre, and this highly regarded show, which tackles the hellish crime and dark legacy of slavery, should be watched and enjoyed by as wide an audience as possible. But the optics of an invitation to just one group of people based upon the pigmentation of their skin to anyone with half a brain is divisive, deranged and potentially dangerous. How does racism fix racism? How does the return of apartheid, which is what this policy effectively amounts to, help people of colour? After decades of progress in the West, much of this looks to be under threat or could even be reversed with the idea that people of colour are somehow tragic victims who need to be among their own, whatever that means, in order to enjoy a show. And how do you define black? What about mixed race people? Asian people, South American people, it makes no sense. Now, defenders of the policy have talked about how unsafe theatres are for some groups. Unsafe. Do me a favour. Firstly, it's wildly patronising and therefore potentially racist to say that theatres are unsafe for certain groups. And also, theatres are only unsafe if you're sat next to someone who's endlessly coughing getting up to go to the loo all the time or spilling their haagen salted caramel ice cream on your lap. Otherwise, theatres are not unsafe. And these performances are apparently there to help patrons avoid what's been called the white gaze. This is progress, is it? Demonising groups based upon immutable characteristics. It's like Martin Luther King never happened. Let's not forget this man is the hero who said that we should be judged on the content of our character, not the colour of our skin. Well, he'd probably be cancelled in 2024 for his wide words and his desire to bring humanity together. Black lives matter, which is why, in my view, people of colour shouldn't be treated like children or victims and be pushed into cultural silos. Here's an idea. Why don't we try to get everyone to go to the theatre? Lower ticket prices, have better marketing of shows across all communities, including to ethnic groups, and have school trips. I agree with The Guardian, who wrote about that this weekend. Theatre is crushingly middle class and should be for all. So maybe all communities could go to the theatre together and learn together and have a good time together. 
all classes, all races, all religions, all backgrounds. This exclusionary stuff is divisive and wrong and probably illegal if enforced very literally. This policy to effectively shut certain people out of performances is a pantomime, a farce and theatre of the absurd. This five-star show gets only one star for common sense. Now, the theatre have made it clear that if you are a white person, for example, or don't identify as black, you can go to the show. You won't be stopped from purchasing a ticket. But the invitation is focused on an audience of colour. But I think it's divisive. I think it's a mistake. But if you back the policy, do let me know. Mark at GBnews.com. First, your response from the pundits tonight comes in the form of political commentator Rebecca Jane, author and journalist... Benedict Spence, and broadcaster and anarchist Dr Lisa McKenzie. Lisa, let me start with you. Uh, your reaction to this idea of a special theatre performance just for one group of people based on their skin colour? I, I heard the interview, actually, with the um, director of the play, and actually his reasoning, I kind of... Un I did understand it, because what he said is he did say ethnic minorities and poor people. He said that together. Mm. He said the theatre is mostly white and middle class. Uh, unsafe, I wouldn't sort of... I wouldn't say that. But I think it can be intimidating. I've been... I, you know, I'm not a massive theatre-goer, but when I have been to the theatre, I am somebody... I think when you come from sort of working-class backgrounds, that sort of theatre, you want to be engaged in it. Mm. And so perhaps you might want to talk or you might want to say, no, I don't agree with that or whatever. Um, and so I do think that sometimes theatre audiences are a bit snobby um, and unwelcoming. And I was actually talking about this to some working-class theatre makers earlier today, and we were talking about Music Hall and how it was a place where people from the same class sort of got together, um, and really how those sorts of things have gone now. And perhaps... I I'm not saying that this is a great idea, but I can kind of... I'm not going to sort of shut it down straight away. I can understand it. Rebecca Jane, the idea of, of, of the, the producer and the director of this show, which is a hit show from America, is to attract people of colour to come to the theatre and watch a show that contains important themes around black history. So what's wrong with inviting a black audience? It, it's not inviting a black audience, is it, though? It's excluding a white audience. You know, racism goes both ways. I don't understand... And I, I actually really would like to be educated as to why this should be something of importance, but all I see is that you can't create inclusivity by being so diversive and segregating people. It is almost like it is becoming shameful in today's society to actually just be white. It's, I can't understand it, Mark, and I'm really struggling and I really want to, and I know that we have to, you know, raise education levels and understanding, but this is not the way to do it. OK, I mean, let's uh, take a listen to the words, Benedict Spence, of Inaya Follerin Iman, who's a brilliant broadcaster and journalist who, of course, used to be here at GB News. Writing for the Mail website, Benedict, she said, I'm appalled that any playwright would contemplate segregating theatre audiences. Black people are perfectly comfortable going to the theatre. We don't need special treatments to enhance our enjoyment. What do you think? I mean, perhaps if they were trying to make a point about segregation, I mean, this is, after all, a play that is based in, you know, in the history of the Deep South, but I don't think that is what they're trying to do. Um, at least that's not what I've heard. Um, I'm completely in favour of this policy because I think that any sort of very self-indulgent plays uh, should have as few uh, audience members as possible, and this is actively trying to stop people from going. So, presumably, it won't last very long because they just won't get the bums on the seats. People won't go through the doors to watch it because they're actively saying to people, please don't come, we're prioritising other people who presumably don't want to come in the first place, uh, so it won't have a particularly long run. I think that this is sort of the free market in action. They're sort of sitting there saying, oh, actually, we're trying to appeal to a demographic that perhaps doesn't want to go to the theatre. Well, the clue there is that it doesn't necessarily want to go to the theatre. And it, on the other hand, it'll also mean that we have to put up with far fewer upper-middle-class white people saying, oh, I went to this really powerful play the other day on slavery. It was that. so... Oh, you just have to see it. <laughs> I think we've all yeah. been spared yeah. a massive 
torment, frankly. Uh, we're not going to get the massive, you know, so, uh, sort of uh, five-star reviews everywhere uh, you, you see on billboards all across London, because nobody will have seen it. Um, I think it's a very positive thing, frankly. OK, okay. well, listen, I know you you're tongue will. in your cheek uh, when you're <laughs> saying that, but uh, it is a concern that people of colour in this country are not going to the theatre, and all that this director is trying to do, and, and of course, the, the venue themselves, is attract people to go and see this important play. But what do you think? Mark at GBNews.com. But next up in the big story, has Britain fallen into the hands of extremists? I'll be asking Britain's best known political double act, the Hamiltons. Plus, following rumours that he sent flirty messages to a colleague, I'll ask Neil and Christine, is Spice Girl Jerry Halliwell right to stand by her man? All of that is next. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. We're always told that there is a, a huge need for care workers in Britain. We're always told that the salaries just aren't big enough against the benefit system for British people to want to do that work. And, and there probably is some real truth in that. Uh, and yet, if up to 25% of those that come are acting illegally, and it would seem up until now, uh, that in some areas, foreign care workers come in but bring in almost the same number of family members with them, that we need to have a proper debate about this. I'm very pleased to be joined by Mike Padgham, chair of the Independent Care Group. If I accept those arguments for a moment, how can it be that the system is so lax that up to 25 per cent are found by the inspector of borders and immigration to be working illegally. Well, good evening to you, Nigel. It was good to join you. I mean, those figures are shocking to me. When I looked at it um, today, when I saw that uh, 275 visas had been issued to a care home that didn't even exist, and uh, a further over a thousand people joined a company that only had uh, previously four staff in it, it makes me wonder. The bureaucracy of the Home Office didn't think to check that these companies exist in the first place because it should be quite straightforward. If people are providing care, they're regulated by the Care Quality Commission. It's a simple phone call to check and double check. Sadly, there seems to have been very many loopholes at the beginning. I believe that's been tight now, but I can't understand it because all the providers that are doing it in the proper way have to go through quite a, a, a rigmarole to actually get approved, and it takes months. So it, it beggars belief that this has happened and people have, have, have been approved for a company that doesn't even exist. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, a big reaction to a London theatre putting on black-only performances. That was the topic of my big opinion. The theatre is saying they want to include people who don't normally attend theatrical performances. Well, the emails are coming in thick and fast. Uh, Leslie Ann says, Hi, can you imagine if a producer said white people only? Can you imagine? This is ridiculous. It is racist, Mark, says Leslie Ann. And uh, Lissy says, Hi, Mark, uh, what happens if a theatre says white people only? Is this not apartheid in all but name? Keep those emails coming, lots more to get through. And I'll be tackling the issue of Prince Harry and his security in the UK at 10 o'clock in my take at 10. You won't want to miss it. But it's time now for the big story. And the Prime Minister addressed the nation from Downing Street yesterday evening in an unexpected and unscheduled statement about the threat of extremism on British democracy. Take a listen. And it is beyond alarming that last night the Rochdale by-election returned a candidate 
who dismisses the horror of what happened on October the 7th, who glorifies Hezbollah and is endorsed by Nick Griffin, the racist former leader of the BNP. Well, old Rishi's not pulling his punches, is he? But was his response about extremism too little, too late? Let's get the views of Britain's best-known political double act, Neil and Christine Hamilton. Uh, Neil, are you pleased to see the Prime Minister finally address this issue? I think it's totally irrelevant. You say he's not pulling his punches. The trouble is he's incapable of punching anything. And uh, he's punching at his uh, level, really, punching at his weight. You know, it's just more and more words. What is he actually going to do about all this political extremism? What's he going to do about the failure of the police to do what the public overwhelmingly wants to do, to take back control of our streets mm. for the overwhelming uh, proportion of the British public that is not in favour of these demonstrations uh, pro-Palestine week after week after week? The trouble is we've got a weak government which has allowed this prior problem to fester away for years without doing anything about it. Even now, he has no serious um, proposals to control the immigration problem of this country. And we're not talking about small boats. We're talking about the 1.4 million residence visas that the government issued last year for foreigners to come and live and work in this country. You know, we've added uh, six and a half million people to our population since 2010, uh, when David Cameron became Prime Minister. You know, we've had an unprecedented rise in immigration under this current Conservative government. And this is the cause of the problem, ultimately. You know, we are now in a society, because the Muslim population is getting to the stage where there's a tipping point, where they reach a, a, a position where you know, their vote really, really matters in an election. I mean, uh, George Galloway got 40% of the vote in Rochdale on a 38% poll gross that up to general election levels, that in itself is 20 or 25 percent of the electorate of Rochdale. And there are many, many towns around the country like this. I mean, only 36 percent of the people who live in London, the whole of London, in the last census, um, designated themselves as white British. You know, and, and we have communities living side by side with one another that don't want to assimilate. And this is going to get worse in the years to come. So I want to know, what is the Prime Minister actually going to do about it? We heard warm words last night. We had no single proposal to do anything at all. Although, Neil, you can't say that those coming to this country, legal net migration, you mentioned the figures, we can debate the scale, but you can't say that all of those people are extremists, and you can't say that all British Muslims are extremists. No, of course not, and I don't say that at all. But... Uh, we have no idea who these people are coming to this country. We don't know what their motivations are. And we know that, uh, that there is a significant number of extremists who are on the MI5 watch list, about 50,000 or so of Muslim extremists on the MI5 watch list. And if we don't know who's coming to this country, whether they're legal or illegal, this is a problem which is only going to increase. And if people okay. are going to start voting on lines of their personal identity rather than on their political ideology, this is a problem which is going to become worse in the British political system. Well, I tend, to agree. I tend to agree that uh, if the outcome of a by-election is based upon a war having, happening several thousand miles away, that is a problem for our democracy, isn't it? It is. I mean, 72 per cent of Muslims in the last general election 2019 voted Labour. So Labour is overwhelmingly dependent upon the votes of migrant uh, communities. Uh, and uh, you know, so the Labour Party will quietly become the spokesman for all these different ethnic groups. Well, uh, what I'm interested in is, is the majority of this country um, who aren't going to identify themselves by the colour of their skin or their religion or whatever, but people who think themselves as British and whose values are what we think as traditional British values and are going to identify with the United Kingdom and its interests rather than the interests of the countries or cultures from which they've come. Well, indeed, of course, uh, you know, we have uh, an ethnic population. Many are successfully integrated in the country. But as you say, with the Prime Minister's warning about extremism, not all. Uh, Christine, is the genie now out of the bottle? I don't know how you could ever police those so-called peace marches every weekend. The cops are outnumbered. Yeah, the genie is undoubtedly out of the bottle. And when I saw Rishi Sunak, and we weren't able to watch it live, but when I caught up with what Rishi Sunak said on the steps of Downing Street, I had the air that he was like Sleeping Beauty. Where's he been for the last 100 years? He's been asleep. Has he not noticed what's... When I say 100 years, I mean his what? Has yeah. he not noticed 
happened on his watch, it's as though he's suddenly woken up to this awful reality which is facing this country. And after the next election, assuming things go according to the way we think they're all going to go, there will be a very large number, and it's not possible, maybe a cephologist could, but it's not really possible to put a number on. And Neil's just alluded to this. There will be a very large number of MPs on the Labour side whose loyalty is not to this country. It's not even to their constituents. I mean, what were George Galloway's first words? This is for Gaza. I'm sorry, but Rochdale really is a very poor part of this country and it needs an MP who's going to say this is for Rochdale, not for Gaza. But there are going to be a large number of MPs whose loyalty is not to this country, it is to their country of origin or it is to their religion. And that, to me, is a very, very lamentable state of affairs for us to find ourselves in. And it seems that Rishi Sunak has just woken up, but it's too late. Of it's course, I'm glad, you, glad you've called Rishi Sunak the sleeping beauty, although I doubt you'd want to give him a kiss. Um, it's worth I'm stressing really that, that... Yeah, go on. I was, trying, I was trying to think, while Neil was talking, I was trying to think of somebody else you know, not sleeping and beauty who'd been asleep for 100 years, but I couldn't. So Rick I, Rick 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 I think it wasn't a bad one. If we're, doing, uh, if we're doing Disney characters, Christine, I wonder if Rishi is Dumbo instead. Um, listen, yeah. let, me, let me say that uh, Labour MPs would contend and uh, Labour themselves would absolutely strongly argue that all of their candidates are focused on the needs of their constituents and the country first. But, of course, you're entitled to your view. Um, let's talk about this other story, if we can. Following allegations that he sent flirtatious texts to a colleague, Red Bull Formula One boss Christian Horner appeared at the Grand Prix today and in a very public display of affection. His wife, Spice Girl Jerry Halliwell, Gave him a big old kiss. So, great news. Look at that. Look at that. That's a, that reminds you of your wedding night, doesn't it, Neil? No. I could recapitulate no. that on GB no. News Live. No, no, no. Uh, uh, listen, let's, uh, let's bring my top pundits into this as well. I'm delighted uh, that with us tonight we have Benedict Spence, Rebecca Jane and Lisa McKenzie alongside the Hamiltons. Uh, first of all, well, you, Christine. Christine, yeah, so um, essentially... It Christian Horner denies the allegations. He's been cleared in an inquiry, so he's been found not guilty. But the rumours are that he sent texts to a female colleague. Is Jerry Halliwell right to stand by her man? If she believes in him, of course she is. I mean, what, what the heck is love for if it isn't standing by your man? It's, I have no idea. Unlike apparently the vast majority of people, I have not seen these texts on social media. I've been too busy recently. So I don't know what exactly was said. It's between him and her. And if they've got something worth saving, it should be able to survive a few texts, frankly. So good for Jerry Halliwell, and I hope she does stand by him, and I hope their marriage survives, because she obviously believes in him, otherwise she wouldn't be there now. She wouldn't have gone out. She would have turned around and come home. So, of course, I hope it survives, yes. I mean, you know, love is a very delicate thing, and it can be broken, and the trust... This is the trouble, the trust. The trust can be broken in an instant. And I hope they can make it through this. I really oh, do. I, I hope so too. Rebecca Jane, is Jerry Halliwell right to stand by her man? Were you convinced by that public display of affection? No, I was not convinced by that public display of affection. I thought it was probably the most embarrassing thing I've seen in a long time. You know, yesterday he's publicly humiliating her and today she stood at his side kissing him on the cheek. I have no respect for people that are not authentic. And if you can't tell me after the messages that came out yesterday that she's blissfully happy with the smirk on her face, then blow me down with a feather. It's an absolute load of nonsense. From the queen of girl power, she has made an absolute embarrassment of herself. I don't think, however, that she should not stand by him. I think that that's fine. I think that the public display of nonsensical, inauthentic affection today is the problem. Lisa McKenzie, Christian Horner, is not Christian Horney, according to his own statement. He denies the allegations. Oh. What do you think? Um, I, did, I did see some of the text earlier, actually, uh, when I was sat in the green room, and they didn't look very steamy to me, actually. They looked a bit rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, yeah. well, it perhaps he should do better. Uh, you know, if she's got eight million reasons to stay, <laughs> then, you know, good luck to her. Because they weren't that, you know, they didn't appear to be... Apparently it was something about, can you do a backflip? 
Yeah, uh, that's that. Split. The split. Split. That was it, yeah. I, I think that was it. Uh, bri briefly, Benedict, before I... Christine, I'll give you the last word. Briefly, Benedict, and then Christine. I mean, Mark, I send lots of people flirty texts. I send you flirty texts. I send producers flirty texts here to try and get on your show. As soon as you give me your number, I'm going to send them. My, my bank manager, my parish priest. You know, honestly, what's life without a couple of flirty texts? And honestly, these seem these seem rather tame. I agree with Lisa. It didn't seem like the sort of thing that you potentially end a marriage over. Christine, you get the last word. Well, I say, I, I haven't seen the text, but I really hope this works. Listen, who hasn't made mistakes in their lives, for goodness sake? Is this the first... <laughs> is this... Has Jerry Hallowell never made a mistake? I mean, you know, I really hope this works. I don't know either of them. I don't know any more details than what I've done. Skim reading the newspapers, but, I mean, I really hope it works. I okay. don't want... Yeah. The yeah. marriage destroyed because of a few flirty texts. Uh, la la last thing. Do you want to give Neil a PDA from us now? No. I don't <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, it's just happened. <laughs> Uh, Neil went for the rear end. Um, listen, folks, thank you very much to the Hamiltons. We'll catch up very soon, <laughs> fabulous folks that you are. Brilliant stuff. What fun. Uh, coming up next is an important discussion because millions are on them. Is antidepressant medication a scam? We'll debate that next. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Is a debate on gender really a far right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase. You know what I mean? Like anyone who talks about anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right because that's what that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her, uh, touching her zip, because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's... she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah, and I know, and also, this isn't a far-right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly... Yeah. I mean, well, this well, is she's, she's, off, we, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far-right. But also, I mean... even if she were right-wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an... One of the most important issues of our day. What well, did Labour playing at here? They're anti democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack a mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say, I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if no, you they say won't. that, will they? Because they? you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <coughs> I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel.
I'll get to your emails very shortly. You're watching Mark Dolan tonight. Uh, but first, millions of people around the world rely on antidepressant medication to get through the day. But do these drugs sometimes do more harm than good? Beverly Thompson is the author of Antidepressed, a breakthrough examination of epidemic antidepressant harm and dependence. And I'm delighted to say that Beverly joins me now. Hi, Beverly. Um, what are the key findings of your book that may surprise my viewers and listeners? Hi, Mark. Thanks for inviting me to talk with you. Um, first of all, I have to say, I do not say people shouldn't take antidepressants. That's their choice. They have a right to take them if they want to. But what I do say is that they should be informed, informed about the potential risks as well as the benefits, which are very few, I have to say. Um, I also have to say when I start to talk about this subject that nobody should ever stop taking antidepressants abruptly. It's very important. So you're right. One in six people in England, that's about 8.6 million people, take antidepressants. And some of these drugs have been on the market now for 30 years, and people have been taking them for 30 years. And we've always trusted our doctors who probably told us that drugs correct our chemical imbalance. Well, recent findings and the debunking of the chemical imbalance theory might have kind of made us question, after 30 years of being on these drugs, as some people have, have we been gullible? Have we been manipulated? Have we been lied to about these drugs? All important questions. Um, tell me about your concerns regarding side effects for a start, because that's a worry, isn't it? Yeah, well, side effects are a huge worry. And, you know, one of the main things that I always say, and, and people are very surprised when I say it, is if you read a patient information leaflet, and not many people do read the patient information leaflet when they get a medication, an, an SSRI antidepressant has nearly 200 side effects nearly 200 mm. that can cause adverse effects. And some of them are very, very serious. Um, there's a couple in particular that, you know, I always have to talk to. And the first is the increased risk of suicide, which we don't talk about enough and we need to talk about more. Because especially with children, children have double the risk of, of, of suicide if they are taking antidepressants rather than if they're not. And studies have, have confirmed this. So we need to be very careful. There's something called akathisia, which we need to learn more about, which does cause people to have suicide, suicide ideation. Um, so there's that. And there's something else at the moment, which is really, really coming into the media. Many people are suffering from something called um, post SSRI sexual dysfunction mm. and young people in particular are not able to enjoy sex, are not able to have sex and this is becoming irreversible and people are finding that this is affecting their lives in major ways. Well indeed, now do antidepressants work for some people? Do you have an estimation of what percentage of these medications are helping people? No, we don't know. Um, you know, the, the placebo trials tell us that placebos work just as well as antidepressants. And what we find that is in real world trials with real patients, they don't work very well at all. So there was a very big study called the STAR-D trial. And even after four courses of treatment of antidepressants, only 34% of patients actually responded positively. Mm. Why do you think the NHS are so keen to hand out these drugs, Beverly? Well, you know, I think, Mark, we have to look at the fact that the constant mental health messages that we're hearing nowadays, and I'm sorry to say it, that's media as well as the politi political obsession with it, um, have led to the increase in antidepressant prescribing. You know, we're told to get help, we're told to get screened, but for the majority of people, because there are no psychological therapies available, what happens is they're prescribed medication, often unnecessarily. Um, if people are struggling with uh, mental health issues, what steps do you think they should take? I think the first thing that a, a doctor or psychiatrist should do is ask them to wait. Because many of the societal 
issues that we're dealing with, many of the personal issues, are transient. Life is very fast moving nowadays. And most of the things that we suffer from, we get over pretty quickly. And, you know, I think there was a study at Brown University in 2006 that showed us if we, if with no somatic treatment, 85% of patients will actually recover within a year. Now, Beverly, briefly, uh, what would you say to those, your critics, who would argue that what you're saying in your book and what you've told me just now is dangerous, ill-informed and wrong? Well, everything that I write in my book is evidence-based. And I come from one perspective, and that is to help patients. And that is the only reason I wrote my book. You know, we're now at an age, Mark, where we need to become empowered. We need more autonomy when it comes to being a patient. Mm. The, I think the age of doctor knows best is well and truly over. Uh, most definitely. And, of course, the pharmaceutical company make a lot of money from these medications. It's important to follow the money, Beverly. Of course they make a lot of money from these medications, but not as much nowadays, obviously. Now we've got the generics, um, as they did mm. when they were they were prescribing the brand drugs. Um, but you're right, it's become a massive industry. And what we're, do what we're seeing is we're seeing these massive industries and the messages that we're sending, they're enabling and allowing governments to fail to acknowledge and address the social, de social determinants affecting our lives which are causing us unhappiness and which are causing us anxiety and are causing all the symptoms we associate with bad health. You know, the chemical imbalance theory, Mark, was a political no-brainer. Mm. Well, there you go. And listen, it's all about challenging orthodoxies. I appreciate your time, Beverly. Let me tell you, the book is out now. It's got the country talking. I've got to say you can agree with it, you can disagree with it, but it's worth a read. It's called Anti-Depressed a breakthrough examination of epidemic antidepressant harm and dependence. Back to me for a second, if you can. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, listen, folks, if you're on antidepressants, don't suddenly come off them. Always take the advice of your GP. If you're feeling depressed, if you're not happy, go to see your GP or A&E, and you've got Samaritans and other online resources. If you're in trouble mentally, do reach out for help. Uh, fascinating stuff coming up in my take at 10. Prince Harry has lost his case against the Home Office for royal protection when he's in the UK. I'll be giving my verdict on whether the prodigal prince should have the same level of security as his brother William. But next up, Mark Meats and two of Britain's leading private detectives tracking down love cheats and crooks. What goes on inside a real detective agency? That's next. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Headliners, tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11pm. Welcome back to Headliners. And, Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old-fashioned, traditional mail breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Row, as hospitals say, hormone-filled milk from trans <laughs> women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue, and they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because, 
you know, when hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo yeah. homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. And I want to show you this a hostel. This is whether it's necessary. The yeah, let's do. Hostel Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences I have read God, just aloud read in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do this show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> Yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yeah. scary thing. And no. when it's not when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than it's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Coming up in my take at 10, in just 15 minutes' time, Prince Harry has lost his case against the Home Office for royal protection when he's in the UK. I'll be giving my verdict on whether the prodigal prince should or should not have the same security as his brother William. But first, Mark Meats. Looking forward to this tonight, the founders of one of Britain's leading private detective agencies, Verity Henton. So tracking down love cheats and crooks. What goes on inside a real detective agency? Sam Hutchinson and Emma Cole, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Lovely to see you both. Hi, Hi Mark. Nice, nice to see you. Very uh, good to see you on a Saturday. How did the agency come about? Because you, I've got history in the police force, haven't you? Yeah, we have. So we were in the police and... We left um, to have our children. Mm. It was kind of... We'd had the kids for a couple of years and we are kind of thinking, oh, what are we going to do with our skills? That's right. You know? And we got really good skills. I mean, we were investigators. I was in for 27 years yeah. and Emma for 16. Great. And we deal with people. Yeah. We're empaths. So, yeah, it was great to kind of come out and say... We were, we were getting together saying, what can we do? Yeah. And you're do good at finding people who are up to no good. It's in your DNA now. Yeah, that's right. Totally that's what is. we did throughout our whole careers. Yeah. Um, so we just wanted to kind of use those skills. And we're nosy, Mark. <laughs> That's absolutely yeah. key. Really nosy. And observant. Yeah. yeah. The clues are out there. Yeah. Uh, so what are the services that you specialise in? So we do a lot of surveillance. Mm. And what so... that involves is f essentially following people. Yeah. Yeah, ba basically, and, and... we find out information. So mm. at Verity Henton, we say to people, our clients, knowledge is power. If yeah. we can do a job and find out information that you don't know when you give us the case, it's a success. Mainly it's... Uh, we do cheating partners, which is one of our main things, catfishing, uh, yeah. scammers, corporate investigations. Right, so, and confidence tricks, there's all of that. Everything. So yeah. if it was uh, adultery, what would happen? Somebody would come and they'd say, oh, I, I think my husband or my wife is being unfaithful. W would you mind gathering some information so that I, I can know more? Yeah, so a lot of people will call us up and they've got just a feeling that something's not right. Mm -hmm. And it might be that they can't really put their finger on something, um, but they've got that feeling. So they call us, we'll talk them through it, and we'll come up with the best cost-effective way of finding out that information. And it might be, let's say it's a potentially cheating husband, it might be that you watch him going to work, you watch him when he comes out of work? Yeah. Basically, we build a plan around the information we have. Amazing. So it may even be that... Um, the client can um, engineer going away on holiday um, to leave the, mm. opportunis the opportunities there for the person. Um, and we would conduct an, a whole investigation around that, whether that including surveillance, tracking, um, we, we do everything. Um, does any of it ever feel morally compromising? Do you ever feel bad about the work you're doing? Not really. I think because we get to know the client so well, yeah. and do you, not... do you not feel like you know, oh, this poor bloke, I'm, I'm harassing him, I'm following him to work? No, and... Definitely not harassing him. <laughs> no. no, we're not. We're not harassing him. So we get to know the clients really well, and yeah. we get involved in the case. Unlike some other people that you may call, who will just kind of take your money and not really give you much information. Yeah. No empathy for the client. Yeah. 
we really get to know them and get involved in the case and we get so emotionally attached that we really want to find out that, that information for also, them. Also, Mark, the people that we're dealing with, you've, we've got a lot of women and men that basically they're being sometimes abused, mm -hmm. yeah. quite seriously. Um, they've been told they're going crazy, they're told they're going mad, they're in therapy. You know, they're in a really bad way. By the yeah. time they come to a private investigator, they're pretty much at the end of their tether. OK, this isn't something you do every day. Yeah. And they really need help. And you can tell that, can't you? When you speak to these yeah. people, they've been, it's been going on for a while. Well, yes, because, for example, a serial, a serial uh, adulterer, that is a form of abuse, isn't it, really? Yeah. Because you're endlessly lying to your partner. Yeah, and it's all more the gaslighting. The gaslighting. Gaslighting yeah. is, a, is a, a known phrase now, but, yeah. you know, a lot of people... That, Am I being paranoid? You're being paranoid. And some people that we have helped have been treated really, really very badly. Mm -hmm. And all they needed was evidence, the evidence to get support from outside members of the family so that they could move on. But they needed that evidence, it was so important. Is it yeah. difficult to trust people after doing this job? Because you see people up to no good. <laughs> Has it affected your view of human nature? A little bit, yes. Mm. <laughs> it hasn't mine so much. But, I mean, I, I dealt with paedophiles before when I was in child mm. protection, yeah. so kind of, like, dealt with that edge of society and now I think yeah I think we just observe more and we, you know what we have learned to do is trust our this sixth sense yes yeah, to right. trust your intuition, intuition. Yeah. it very rarely lets us down and yeah. I mean for those watching what might some of the clues be that your partner is being unfaithful um mm. an obvious one is being quite secretive over your phone mm. um taking it to the shower with you and things mm. like that um, lack of sex in the relationship, yeah. lack of intimacy, mm. um, sneaking off for phone calls. Um, Late nights at work. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, Business the usual trips. kind of things, yeah. I think in a relationship, you know, in, in an intimate relationship, I think it's quite easy to tell when your partner has, you know, slipped away from you yeah. emotionally, detached mm. themselves. It's at that stage that you think something's going on here. And it might not be. I mean, that's the other thing we do. We do prove people's innocence. Yeah. Mm. As well as proving if they are guilty, because we are following people and we've gone back to clients and yeah. said, this guy is not doing anything wrong. You need to yeah. sit down. You need to have some therapy together and work through this. Yeah, sometimes clients are just paranoid. Yeah. Um, maybe they're suffering with anxiety and they're just paranoid that their partner's doing something. We'll follow the partner and we'll provide the evidence that actually they're doing what they're saying they're well, doing. Well, yeah, further to what I was asking you earlier, it strikes me that what you do is deeply ethical, yeah. not unethical, because yeah. what you do is you simply get to the truth, which is what a police officer does, a yeah, detective. Right. It's now what you do for people in a domestic setting. So, um, are there any cases that have stood out over the years, without naming names, where, where you just thought it was a remarkable situation to deal with? We've got so many stories. Yeah. <laughs> Every day is... You must, you yeah. must have yeah. saved... You've, you've obviously... What you've doubtless done is you've ended a few marriages and saved a couple as well, right? I think we've yeah. saved lives, I have to be honest. Really? Now, how, so in what yeah. context? How yeah. could you say that? Well, Tell me, me more. Let me tell you about one case. Um, we can't go into it too much, yeah. obviously, wouldn't, but um, it's a, a lady that was being scammed for hundreds of thousands of pounds, and she thought she was with um, a reasonably famous person in London. Mm. Mm. They'd bought a house and online, they'd FaceTimed, they'd, they'd had a full-on relationship, although they'd never met. And, of course, uh, he then... Um, he wanted to expose her... Uh, to her church, to her school. When she refused to pay money and the money dried up, he said, well, that's it. I'm going to send the sexual videos that we've done together. I'm going to send these to everybody. So everybody knows. And she yeah. was in a state and she was at the brink of suicide. We spent nights and nights on the phone to her, talking to her. This was way beyond what any other investigation companies yeah. would do at Verity Henton. We are so involved with the client and we care. We actually were empaths. We care about our clients. And I guess what you do eventually sometimes dovetails into the law and you, you might be in a position yeah, where you'll right. share the information you have with we the authorities. Lot, yeah, quite often. We do a lot. Given that if you think that, I mean, for example, revenge porn, that's illegal, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, yeah, so. and sextortion. Yeah. The trouble is, unfortunately, with the foot police force, um, they just do not have the manpower mm. and the resources yeah. to deal with some of these. So we're finding more cases come to us first yeah. to collect the evidence, to put into a package, to then present to the police. Oh, it's remarkable. Um, have you got, uh, have you got like a brown Mac? Have you got the pork pie hat? We've got some wigs. You've you got, you got some wigs? Some disguises. We've got some, we've got some great disguises. Have you done stakeouts where you sit in the car and, got... and wait for someone to come out of a building? Yeah, of course. Yeah, All the time. Yeah, of course. Unbelievable. I mean, not so much us now, because we're the, the face of the business. And yeah, we are, of course. And we, we're people. running it, but we do have people that do all of that for us. Look, it's been a thrill 
to Can have I say one more thing? Anything. Just, it's very, very important yeah. that before you employ a private investigator, you make sure that they're registered with the Association of British Investigators, the ABI. It's an unscrupulous industry. Right. It's not licensed. And anyone, you could set up, Mark, as a, I think you'd be quite good. You I'd could try. set up as a PI <laughs> tomorrow, but make sure they're registered. The ABI. Uh, there you go. Well, look, plenty of private detective agencies are available, but Verity Henton is the brainchild of Sam Hutchinson and Emma Cole. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Do yeah, come thanks, back and Matt. see us thank again you, soon. Uh, next up, Prince Harry. Does he deserve the same royal protection as his brother, William? I'll be giving my verdict in my take of 10. You won't want to miss it. feeling inside from box spoilers sponsors of weather on gb news hello there i'm greg dewhurst and welcome to your latest gb news weather it's going to be quite chilly tonight some frost and fog and some icy stretches around but sunday should be drier and brighter we currently have low pressure in charge of our weather but it does start to move away through sunday allowing a drier day before then further wet and windy weather spreads in from the west for monday for this evening time, we do have outbreaks of showery rain, sleet and some hill snow across northern England, spreading into Scotland, parts of Northern Ireland and some western fringes of Wales too. Elsewhere, we'll see some clear spells and as temperatures drop overnight, we'll see some mist and fog patches forming, some icy stretches too. Temperatures in the countryside, minus two to minus five Celsius. So could be some tricky traveling conditions across central southern parts of England first thing, dense fog patches, but they slowly lift and break. And then for most, it's a bright and cheery day, plenty of sunny spells, a scattering of showers across western parts of the UK. And this weather front close to the east could give some patchy rain along the east coast. Temperatures up a little bit compared to Saturday, a bit more brightness around. It will just feel a little less cold. Then into Monday, this weather system starts to move into western areas, bringing some outbreaks of heavy rain and brisk winds too. Elsewhere, a cold, frosty start, but then plenty of sunshine across the north and the east through the day, and temperatures a little higher once more. It remains mixed Tuesday and towards the middle of the week, but temperatures a little above average. See you soon. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Jacob rees and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg's State of the Nation, Monday to Thursday from 8pm. You're now in exile. I imagine it wouldn't be safe for you to go back to Russia. Can I ask you if you feel safe personally... Uh, and what do you think can be done to remove Putin, or is he going to be there for as long as he wants? Uh, I think that's, that is, of course, a fundamental question. It is, uh, there should be pressure inside Russia and outside. Inside Russia right now, this is impossible, because Putin put all leaders in jail, and some of us just abroad, you know, just two were already killed. Mr. Nemtsov, Boris Nemtsov, my friend, my collaborator on my party, was, was killed in the walls on Kremlin. Alexei Navalny was killed in jail and in the camp. And that is, the, the people live in fear, in the fear to identify themselves as the protesters, to identify themselves as against Putin's regime, etc. That's why today there is no no chance for opposition to raise in, inside Russia. But outside, of course, this war against Ukraine, that is the fundamental issue for all foreign leaders. And in fact, just support of Ukraine and to not to let Putin to, to, to destroy Ukraine, to defeat, destroy, uh, to defeat uh, uh, Ukraine, that is an important issue. Because just Ukraine, that's not just in Ukraine, war in Ukraine. Ukraine just fighting for their territorial integrity, but fighting for the whole European countries. Because after Ukraine, other countries could appear, other uh, subject of uh, aggression could be, and Putin easily could try to test Article 5 of NATO, NATO Charter. It, it could, well, be, could be one of the small countries of uh, Baltic states. 
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, Prince Harry has lost his case against the Home Office for royal protection when he's in the UK. I'll be giving my verdict on whether the prodigal prince should have the same royal protection as his brother William. Also, Queen Camilla gets a well-deserved break, a possible new role for Prince Andrew and Joe Biden has another senior moment or two. We'll get reaction from the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Plus tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. So a packed show, lots to get through. My verdict on Prince Harry straight after the headlines and Tatiana Sanchez. Mark, thank you and good evening. Your top stories from the GB Newsroom. Dozens of pro-Palestine marches took to the streets across Britain today after the Prime Minister called on organisers not to let extremists hijack protests. In a speech last night, Rishi Sunak called for the nation to unite and said Islamist extremists and far-right groups are spreading poison. It followed George Galloway's controversial win in the Rochdale by-election this week, which the Prime Minister described as beyond alarming. The US military has carried out its first airdrop of aid into Gaza. The operation, carried out jointly with Jordan's Air Force, comes after the deaths of Palestinians queuing for food, which brought renewed attention to the growing humanitarian catastrophe. President Biden says he hopes to see a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas before the start of Ramadan on the 10th of March. The retirement of 30 jets that were used to protect British skies from potential attacks has been likened to scrapping spitfires before the Battle of Britain. RAF bosses are grounding the fleet of typhoons in an effort to save a reported £300 million, despite only completing 40% of their predicted flying hours. It comes as the Defence Secretary has urged the Chancellor to increase military spending to 2.5% of GDP, something Jeremy Hunt says won't be in next week's budget. Police are still investigating after three people were left injured in a shooting in South London. A warning, uh, flashing images coming up. Two women were hit by shotgun pellets after a suspect dropped a firearm during a police pursuit in Clapham. A third person, who was a 27-year-old pedestrian, was injured by the moped itself. They've all now been released from hospital. Police are still trying to find the suspects. And as you've been hearing, Queen Camilla will take a break from official duties after leading the monarchy in public since the king's cancer diagnosis. It's understood she'll spend a few days of private downtime with the king and her own family. Her Majesty will resume engagements on the 11th of March when she'll represent the king and lead the royal family for the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey. King Charles has withdrawn from public duties whilst he undergoes treatment, but he's continuing to work on his red boxes and other state duties in private. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen, or you can go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Mark. My thanks to Tatiana Sanchez, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Queen Camilla gets a well-deserved break, a possible new role for Prince Andrew, and Joe Biden has another senior moment or two. We'll get reaction from the Queen of US royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. With me tonight, political commentator Rebecca Jane. 
author and journalist Benedict Spence, and broadcaster and anarchist Dr. Lisa McKenzie. Plus, my pundits will be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros of the day. A busy hour, and those papers are coming, but first, my take at 10. Prince Harry has lost his legal case against the Home Office for top-level police protection when he's in the UK. Now, God knows uh, I've had my disagreements with Prince Harry in recent years. It's my view that he threw his family, his country and the monarchy under the bus just to make a fast buck. It's worth remembering that back in the day, Prince Harry was one of the most popular royals. Cheeky, party-going, fun-loving, a breath of fresh air. He served in the military. He was one of the boys. He liked to drink. He liked a lady, no problem. A dashing young prince with a big future and an inexhaustible well of public support. But Hooray Harry became the prodigal prince. And now many in his own family and in his home country will never forgive that devastating Oprah Winfrey interview in which he and his wife Meghan effectively accused the royal family of racism, a devastating accusation from which the couple later rode back by talking about unconscious bias instead. But the damage was done. There was the cringeworthy Netflix series when, in one particular scene, Harry had to sit there whilst his wife Meghan mocked having to curtsy to Queen Elizabeth. At that point, even the prince looked embarrassed to be there. Now, the royals are all celebrities. They are in the front line, and they should be able to handle a bit of public criticism and accountability, even if it's friendly fire from the formerly helicopter-flying Harry. But the book Spare crossed the line. Not so much because of its content, it turned out to be a bit tamer than some of Harry's previous comments. It was the fact that as she battled poor health in her ninth decade, his grandmother, the Queen, had to grapple with the knowledge that his book was coming. It was hanging over our monarch like the sword of Damocles. And this remarkable lady was left with many months of worry about what might be in the book and what damage it might do to a family and an institution to which she devoted her life. Some have said that the Harry drama hastened the Queen's demise. We will never know, and to me that sounds a bit harsh on Harry, but it certainly can't have done her health the power of good, and Prince Harry will have to live with that thought. However, I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution. He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. Charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure. And unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty.
It's the first nice thing I've said about Prince Harry in about 11 years, but I do think he needs royal protection. I know it's irritating, I know it's frustrating, I know it's an insult how he's behaved, but he did not choose to be the son of the king. What's your view? Mark at gbnews.com. Let's get the reaction now of my top pundits, political commentator Rebecca Jane, free from the shackles of UKIP, an independent woman once again, allied to no party other than his own journalist Benedict Spence, and fearless broadcaster and official anarchist Dr Lisa McKenzie. Rebecca Jane, I think that Prince Harry needs full armed security when he's in Britain. What's your view? No. Um, you say, obviously, he didn't choose to be born into the royal family, but he did choose to leave. And that is something that comes with being part of the royal family, which is something that he made this big triumphant announcement that he no longer wanted to be part of and he wanted to go and live this lovely, quiet life in, in America. Well, if he went and lived the lovely, quiet life in America, he probably wouldn't need the security that he now claims to need. You know, I, I don't understand it in the slightest. Go and live that little peaceful life that you kept on talking about so much and get rid of the whole royal family that you so apparently despise now. OK, on no uncertain terms there. Benedict Spence. I mean, he's still, I think, what, fifth in line to the throne? He hasn't actually stepped away from the line of succession. So he does remain a, a, a relatively important part of the royal family in that sense. And I think, uh, you know, especially in the week that we've discovered that there's going to be extra money made available for police protection for MPs, uh, certain MPs, uh, because of threats against them, I think we have to recognise, actually, that there are many public figures. Sadly, we've allowed ourselves to get to a position where there are many public figures who are threatened uh, by members of the public for various different reasons, and I think Prince Harry probably falls under that category. What do you think, Lisa McKenzie? I know you'd rather not have a royal family at all, but if you are the son of the king, do you need armed cops around you? I thought I was going to agree with you tonight. I thought you were going to do a scathing uh, sort of take on, on Harry costing us money. And now I find I'm... You've not done that. I'm a bit disappointed. I was going to agree with you. I was surprised. Oh, no. mm. I'm, I like I'm, to keep you guessing. I know, so I'm really uh, disappointed that I can't agree with you. But no, I, he's gone to America. It's the best place for him. It's the best place for all of them, actually. I think they should all go there. <laughs> I've said it many times. Go and live in the Disney castle. Wave at people. Let the Americans pay for all of them. I don't want to pay for any of them. Oh, <laughs> <That's Hello. laughs> but I mean, do, 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 does it not weigh on your on your mind and your conscience, Lisa, that given his high profile position because of an accident of birth, unfortunately, this guy is a target for some bad people, Lisa? No, it doesn't weigh on my conscience at all because I know that there are other people because of the accident of their birth, they might starve to death in the next two years or they might not be able to put the heating on and might freeze to death. Mm. So, you know, accident of birth works both ways. He gets the good times, you know. He, he's, he's not sort of uh, 51 weeks of the year sort of freezing and then comes to England and can't have any... Free coppers. <laughs> Although, Benedict, I mean, I do wonder, you know, God forbid if something happened to Harry, and we pray that will never happen, but, but if it did, I don't think it would reflect very well on the United Kingdom as a country. No, it wouldn't. And again, I also think it's a bit sort of churlish of us to say, oh, well, you turned your back on sort of royal duties, therefore you're sort of at the mercy of, of, of whatever might happen to you. And I actually... Yeah, I don't think, in the grand scheme of things, the things that we do spend money on, given the amount of prote police protection, as I say, that is already given to a lot of people, I don't think sort of sparing a couple of officers here and there when he's in the UK, which is not very often, uh, is a massive take out of the out of out of the um, the personal protection budget. I'm sure actually that they can be spared from other members of the royal family as and when is necessary. So I do think that there's a sort of a, it's a sort of a quite a, a, a uniquely British, quite churlish, quite sort of penny-pinching attitude to say, ah, well, you know, that sucks for you, but you're just going to have to sort of lump it. I, I think, actually, we're better than that, frankly. Uh, Rebecca Jane, I think if, in the end, he is granted police protection in this country, those coppers will need to be paid double just to put up with all of his moaning and his navel-gazing. But yes. um, we, we do need to reflect on what happened to his mother, Diana. Now, a top royal security insider told me recently that if Diana had had proper British police protection, she'd be with us today. Do we want to make the same mistake twice? Right. 
listen, it's two different stories. And also, we're talking about protection when he's here in the UK. What happened to Diana was obviously not obviously here That's in the true. UK. Then also, we talk about the other the stance of this is that, you know, when he chose to leave, you're not trying to tell me now that UK police officers are the absolute best in security there could ever be. He chose to go over to America. He chose to make a commercial life for himself. He can pay for the best security that there is. He's made those decisions. He knew that it was part of the deal when he decided to leave and become this commercial figure. And he's probably not making the money that he thought he was going to make. So now he's coming back here begging for help. You know, you made the decision, live with it, or, I tell you what, make amends, go back to your father, say, really sorry, shouldn't have left, try and make an apology to the British public and then maybe you can have mm. your security too. There you go. What's your view? Do you think that uh, Harry should have the same royal protection as his brother William when he's in the United Kingdom? Coming up, Queen Camilla gets a well-deserved break, a possible new role for Prince Andrew, and Joe Biden has another senior moment or two. We'll get reaction from the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting Kinsey Schofield. Plus, those papers are on the way. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer, weekends from 3 p.m. Sadiq Khan, yeah. 6.3 million on a virtue signal, loaded yeah. lines. Why is he spending the people's money in this way. And why is nobody saying yeah. anything? I want to hear from Suzanne Hall, the potential Conservative candidate, yeah. or Howard Cox, the potential Reform candidate who could potentially take this off Sadiq Khan. Why are they not speaking? This is ridiculous. It, well, it was, it was sprung on everybody. Did you know about that? I, I didn't, didn't know, know about it. it. Nobody knows. So they're spending this money, they're spending yeah. 6.3 million pounds, and no one knew about it. Where's the press? Where are the public consultations? No one knew. I think, I think it was, it's a good idea to rename the train lines, because all these train lines mm -hmm. So there are like four of them, six of them, whatever, and they're all going all these different directions. And you tell someone to come, and you don't, you don't even know the name. Yeah, but six point three million. Listen, if you want to give me six point three million to come yeah. up with some virtue signalling lies, yeah. I, I'd like to know which advertising agency he employed to do this, how long it took him, yeah. and why, why he's even done it in the first place. Why has he done this? He has done this. We, look with the virtue signalling because he's part of Team World. He's Rishi Sunak. He, it's, it's this whole concept is every inclusiveness. There is no country, nobody's English, our own history is bad, our, not my history, but whatever, the English history is bad. And it's a, it's a denial of history. It's Orwellian or something. Yeah. Not that I know I about I think it's it. an absolute absurdity that Sadiq Khan should be doing that. He's got a knife crime epidemic, yeah. a crime epidemic, people stealing watches off people walking down the yes. street. Yes. You've got the burglary at an all-time high. London, a lot of people are put off by yeah. it. And this is what he spent £6.3 million pounds this on. This could have been a bit... to speak as to why... Some bit that he doesn't need to speak. People he, need he, to speak out and say, well, yeah. why didn't we know about this? Yeah. But the idea... Can I say something to you, Nana? Mm. The idea is right. It's like, for example, take the Northern Line. You know, there were six Northern Lines. Six Northern Lines. Six different Northern Lines. Oh, maybe yeah. more now, because one goes from Mill Hill East, yeah, but this Mill Hill... the overground he was... GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Well, a big reaction to my take at 10. I've caused some controversy by suggesting that I think Prince Harry should have proper top-level royal police protection when he's in the UK, the same level as his brother William. Why? Because it wasn't his choice 
to be the son of the king. Well, the emails are coming in thick and fast and largely you do not agree with me. Peter says, good evening, Mark. If you left GB News, God forbid, says Peter, would you expect them to continue to give you luncheon vouchers? No, you wouldn't. Harry left the monarchy, so no more freebies for him. I remember luncheon vouchers, weren't they fantastic? Bring them back, I say. Peter, thank you for your kind words. Uh, Nick says, uh, Mark, Harry is not a working royal, doesn't pay UK tax. He can pay for his own security. No, 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 says James, who's not happy with me. James says, I will never, ever, ever watch you again. Uh, this guy asked to be a target by his dreadful behaviour. No, he should not have protection. Princess Diana refused royal protection. Uh, Janie, um, if Harry is to be treated equally to his brother whilst in the UK, he must behave accordingly. He lacks the manners that befit a middle-aged man, let alone a prince of the United Kingdom. Let me tell you that you predominantly disagree with me. I've got one message of support from Andy, who says, Hi, Mark, I agree with your thoughts about Prince Harry, but I think he's been placed in the middle by Meghan Markle. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it is uh, me, Meghan, or your family, and that's his problem. Andy, thank you for that. Thank you for your emails. I love getting them. It's the best bit of the show. Keep them coming. Mark at gbnews.com. But first, US News and the Queen of American Showbiz Royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Uh, Kinsey, great to have you back on the show. Now, listen, you, uh, we're, not, well, we're not slated to talk about the Prince Harry story, but um, I've kind of surprised a few people by suggesting that I think he should have armed royal protection when he's in Britain. What do you think? Well, they aren't my taxpayers that are my tax dollars that are paying for Prince Harry's protection. But I agree with you. I think that he should feel safe and he should feel safe to bring his family back to see his father if that's the case. Mm. Well, listen, let's talk about his mother-in-law, not mother-in-law, his stepmother, uh, Kinsey. Queen Camilla gets a well-deserved break. Tell me more. That's right. Queen Camilla has no engagements on her agenda this week, with the Times reporting that she will spend a few days of downtime with the king. Camilla has been working overtime to support the monarchy just last week. Last month, she repeatedly drove over six hours to a royal engagement after her flight was grounded because she reportedly did not want to let down her husband. She will resume engagements on March 11th, representing the king and leading the royal family for the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey. A source told The Times, although she was not expecting to find herself in the position of leading the family, the queen is absolutely prepared to do whatever needs to be done for the institution. And can I just say, speaking of Harry, I think the fact that Queen Camilla is seen as leading the family is significant proof that Prince Harry would not return to mm. temporarily support the family because Camilla's elevated position is likely not something sitting well with him right now. He loved Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah. He likely resents the idea of Queen Camilla. And we know um, that that's a position he felt like his mother should be in. Most definitely. He was very nasty about Queen Camilla in his book, Spare. <laughs> He was. So I imagine that the idea of her leading the family is something he has a hard time digesting. There you go. Um, what about uh, Princess Kate? Um, I understand that uh, a big star in America made a joke about her. Well, you're being very kind. Big star, 90s <laughs> pop star, but breast cancer survivor. Cheryl Crow posted a video on X announcing an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel Live. The caption read, I'm going to be on Jimmy Kimmel Live tonight, but where's Kate Middleton? In the video, she's telling a person, like a makeup person or something out of frame, if you can speed it up by meeting Kate Middleton for lunch. Reaction online has been mixed, but some users were quick to point out the coverage of Crow's difficult breast cancer diagnosis and treatment and asked where her empathy was. Remember? There were rumors that Lance Armstrong had broken up with her over her breast cancer. That had to have been hard tabloid fodder for her to consume. Someone else tweeted, I thought you were dead and you're here asking about Catherine. I guess the lesson is think before you tweet, except I haven't thought of Cheryl Crow in 20 years. So maybe mission accomplished. There you go. Let's hopefully uh, uh, put it down as another 20 years to come before we talk about her again. Um, what about Princess Catherine? Um, do we know how she's doing? Do we have a right to know about her health at all, Kinsey? Well, according to the Times, uh, we ha we did hear about Princess Catherine this week. She told Page Six here, uh, here in the States, her representative said she's doing well. We're not giving any more updates. But according to the Times, Prince William is finding the level of social media commentary around his family challenging as of late. 
I'd like to say something that he can't. It's none of your damn business, Mark. It's none of my business. The Princess of Wales and her team stated very clearly that privacy was all they asked for until Easter. And this is a hot take, but Harry and Meghan have spent four years oversharing, and it's warped our mm. expectations of mm. real working royals versus the Montecito reality stars. Harry's book, their Netflix Winch Fest, and Meghan announcing her miscarriage in the New York Times. That is not the type of behavior we can expect from working members of the royal family. So to quote my least favorite Disney movie, let it go. <laughs> Catherine is the definition of strength, stoicism, Never complain, never explain. You will not find her doing the media rounds looking for sympathy over this mystery ailment. And that is why one day she will be queen. Uh, speaking of somebody that would like to be queen, but likely only the queen of Hollywood, Meghan Markle, uh, who's made a new appointment. Tell me more. Oh, my goodness. To continue with the 666 Harry and Meghan relaunch slash rebrand, according to page six, Meghan has hired Adele's stylist, who will hopefully in turn introduce Meghan to a steamer and a tailor, if I'm being honest. <laughs> according to La Lauren Sherman, who got this scoop, quote, Markle needs to make money and sharpening her look could be the first step in something bigger. Not only should she be gunning for endorsements, but I wouldn't be surprised if she was keen to develop her own fashion line. I hope she develops some Spanx knockoffs like Kim Kardashian. She could call them Suspanks or Princess Panties. You're on fire tonight. Somebody that sadly is not on fire is the leader of the free world. Joe Biden has another senior moment. Uh, Alistair, I think you've got a, a clip. Uh, do, you want, do you want to talk us into this clip? Uh, do you know the clip that's coming, Kinsey? I mean, well, I, I, I should, but there are so many gaps these well, days. Well, I, think, I think this one pertains to his oh. uh, confusion about geography. Yes, on Friday. In the coming days, we're going to join with our friends in Jordan and others in providing airdrops of, of uh, additional food and supplies into Ukraine. OK, so for those that weren't fully concentrating, what did he do in that clip? What went wrong? Yes, yeah, so this was yesterday. He confused Gaza with Ukraine twice as he announced that the U.S. would provide additional aid to Palestinians. This is not a hot topic of conversation in the state. 65% believe the Israel-Hamas war is important to them, and 59% of Americans believe the war between Russia and Ukraine is important, according to a, a Pew Research Center. So this is not necessarily, you know, on everybody's minds. Uh, however, over the weekend, comedian Bill Maher gave a blistering monologue on Biden's age, saying the president walks like a toddler with a full diaper. Oh, dear. Uh, at what point do you think the penny will drop that this guy is not well enough mentally to be president? You and I have been talking for two years about how Michelle Obama might step in, and we're just now seeing some of those stories circulating in mainstream media. I'd say any day now. Wow. Uh, listen, Kinsey, always the highlight of the weekend having you on. We'll catch up in a week's time. My thanks to the Queen of US Showbiz Royal and Political Reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Check out her brilliant website, To Die For Daily, and the podcast of the same name. Next up, the papers with full pundit reactions. See you in two. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6 a.m. People in this field and... and and they talk about mental health assistance. And I know from personal experience within my own family circle mm. that the help is just not there. I know that with speaking to many families who've got autistic children and adults, they are really struggling at the moment, whether it's to do with education, getting a diagnosis. You know, once they get to 18 to 25, where's the help? There isn't the help there with social care. You know, I just set up a petition as well, who's going to look after my sons when I'm no longer around? Because that's what parent. that's the story mm. and the question that's at the back of every parent's mind. It's just so hard at the moment and lots of small charities are closing and for me they're the backbone of the society because they're the ones that speak you know to parents continually all the time or autistic adults so. And why has it to be that way and you know we'll get government minister after government minister coming on and saying 
We, we have greatly added to the resource here. We have had another two and a half people we've hired last year and whatever. I mean, they, they twist statistics and they make it all sound good. But I know from the work I do in the charitable world and I know from people who I, I know personally, it just isn't there. So stop telling it, it it is. And the thing is, the demand for mental health care has just woo, ballooned. Well, the earlier you start working with children who are autistic, the better the outcomes. I've seen it myself, and I know it with my own sons. I shouldn't have had to set up a school and remortgage my home, you know, for my boys. And so many parents are still struggling, like, 20-odd years from when my boys were diagnosed. And it's, they're saying it's improving, it's improving, and we're talking about awareness, we're talking about acceptance. It's hard, mm. because I'm juggling caring, I'm juggling, you know taking him to college, picking him up, you know, I'm running a charity, I'm doing events. I know I'm a workaholic, but I'm very passionate and I'm very driven. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. OK, folks, uh, it's time now for tomorrow's at Front Pages with full pundit reaction. Let's go. Uh, secret papers to be released. Andrew faces fresh court bombshell. Prince Andrew will face new questions over his support of paedophile pal Jeffrey Epstein with the shock release of more court papers. Another headache for Prince Andrew and for the palace. Sunday Times now, widely prescribed anti-anxiety drug linked to hundreds of deaths. What a coincidence, given the fact that I've just spoken uh, to a top author on the subject of antidepressant medication, uh, Beverly Thompson, who was uh, rather sceptical about uh, these drugs. We'll debate that with my panel shortly. Also, Chancellor in last-ditch fight to cut tax by 2p. Uh, holiday lets to be targeted as Hunt scrambles to raise cash and offer pre-election sweetener. Post office boss said he would quit unless he got a million pounds. Sunday Express now, why voters love Donald Trump. And angry pensioners pre-budget warning to Hunt. Cut tax or lose the grey vote. Tories have been warned they face a furious backlash from older voters if they fail to cut income tax in the budget this week. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has lowered his sights and is now edging towards a further reduction in national insurance, but it will not help the over 65s after the number liable to pay income tax almost doubled since the Conservatives came to power. The Observer, tax cuts will backfire, top economists warn Hunt, and fears over asthma drug side effect for children. And last but not least, Daily Star Sunday, fine dining exclusive. My name's Megan and I'm a mayo-holic. Boring Belgians famously love to dip their chips in mayonnaise, but Brit Megan Tompkins is so addicted to the bottle gloop, she smothers all her food in it, including curries and porridge, no less. Oh. What is the world coming to? Let's She's get well. full pundit reaction to mm. all of those stories. We've got one more, actually. Alice, when you get a second, do you mind just running us back to the Sunday Times? It is important, and I'll tell you for why. When you get a second, fire that one up, because it is the showbiz story of the day. Winning together. This is Jerry Halliwell, Ginger Spice, of course. Uh, embracing her Formula One husband, boss, Christian Horner, who's been mired in sex allegations, which he denies. But the show must go on, according to this couple. Um, a public display of affection. Is Jerry Hel Halliwell right to stand by her man? I'll debate that with my pundits, who tonight are the brilliant political broadcaster, Rebecca Jane, journalist, Benedict Spence, and academic and anarchist, no less, Dr Lisa McKenzie. OK, folks, lots of stories to get our teeth into. Benedict, can Britain afford tax cuts in next week's budget? Uh, almost certainly not. We're almost certainly not going to get the tax cuts that we need. But at the same time, 
what we really need is growth, and one of the great ways that you can get growth is by getting people spending again in the economy and getting businesses being able to operate uh, on better margins. So you would hope that there would be some sort of tax alleviation, but there isn't going to be. And this is going to be a real damp squib, I'm afraid. We've been uh, promised for a very long time by the Conservatives um, that tax cuts are coming. A bit like how Game of Thrones spent sort of five years promising us dragons. Oh, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Yeah. And it got further and further, and then by the time they came, the show wasn't very interesting anymore. That's what these tax cuts basically after the Tories. They've been saying tax cuts are coming, tax cuts are coming, uh, but they're not actually going to do anything for you when they come. They're not going to be very large. I mean, here we are sort of fighting over two pence, tuppence. It's, it's not going to make the blindest bit of difference if it actually does come in. And even if they do bring in tax cuts, it's too late now for people mm. to feel the change in their pocket, which is actually mm. what they would vote on, not tax cuts that they would say, look, you've been in 14, you've been in power 14 years, uh, why haven't you done it beforehand? They're going to say, I want to know whether or not I feel wealthier now than I did at the start of the parliament and it's hard to find anybody who feels yeah. even on parity with how they were at the no. start of this parliament. But Lisa McKenzie, if you cut taxes, mm. you're going to have the economy growing, which is more money for the NHS, for schools, for policing and all the rest of it. See, they always use that, but that's that's not... And, and as Benedict says, there's nothing going to be quick here. Mm. I mean, if they cut taxes, and even if that, that model did work, which there's not any evidence it does, because uh, trickle-down has never worked. It's no, there's never been any evidence that it works. But even if it did, you're looking sort of two, three years, four years into the future before anybody would actually feel it. And that's not, you know, that, that it's not going to happen. Uh, but isn't this about tax cuts for ordinary working Brits? I agree with you. I don't think the billionaires getting richer really helps any no. of us, as long as they stay in the UK and spend their money here. But nurses, doctors, uh, other people, people that work in education like you, surely they could do with a few more quid in their pocket, and that's what tax well, cuts would deliver. Well, we do, but we do deserve money because we've had um, pay disparity for sure. a long time. But these sort of little bits of tax cuts here and there is not going to—it's not going to do what we need it to do. You know, at the moment, I, I live in a city that yeah. is now bankrupt. Yeah. Mm. Now, that is what people are that's, talking about. Uh, that's Nottingham. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're actually bankrupt, right. which means the services are cut to the bone. So, the, if the Tories want to do something, then perhaps looking at um, local services actually might be a better vote winner. Well, what do you think about this, Rebecca Jane? I know you believe in low tax in principle. Can the country afford them? Like you've both just said, I don't think it's going to make the blindest bit of difference right now. And, you know, if we look at the express headlines, cut tax or lose grey vote, that's not going to swing a grey vote for you. What will swing a grey vote is actually if you sort out the NHS, you sort out crime mm. and you actually, well, you know, immigration, dare I say it. There is, you know, we have a lot of these headlines about there is record spending in the NHS. Yes. The problem's not the money and where it's coming from. The problem is they don't know how to spend it because they don't have a flipping clue what they're doing. And I nearly swore. It's well, <laughs> I mean, it's where away. It's after the watershed it's, and it's Saturday night. Knock yourself. My out. mother had killed me. It's got it's <laughs> gotta be said though, if we're talking about winning back the grey vote. Ultimately, what are the things that would really benefit the country right now? What would really kickstart growth? Things like building, actually being able to build things in the first place, that would help growth. Things like energy prices, that would really yeah. help growth. Housing. But actually, yeah, yeah. Housing would help, although it won't bring no. down prices, but we do have a shortage, but energy is the other thing. And actually, what is the thing that stops us from having these things? It tends to be the grey vote. It tends to be older people at a local level opposing things from being built. And I'm afraid <laughs> you get the country that you deserve. And what we will have in this country, what we have had for a very long time is people who say I like the idea of growth I like the idea of houses I like the idea of all of these things I just oh, don't I want them think. near me I just don't want it, anything to do with me I don't yeah. want a new water reservoir near me because it might you know affect my view it might affect the value of my house and that ultimately is the the damn on growth so it's all very well if if older people were actually inclined to vote for lower taxes then fine but that's not going to fix there, the there problem. are a lot there I mean I've got to say that there are I've spoke to a lot of people recently who are pensioners that weren't in the tax bracket, and over the last year or two, they've actually started to fall into the mm. to the tax bracket. So I think they have noticed that. But 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 Lisa, do you not accept that high taxes are killing the economy at the moment? We've got anemic growth, haven't we? The economy needs a tiger in the tank. It needs a kickstart. I think if there's a choice between a housing policy that delivers decent housing for everybody, mm. 
or ta small tax cuts, I think the country would go for the housing. And that's where I, that's where I think the one policy of the, one needs One of the to go. difficulties that we have with that is, though, whilst we have a policy that this government has of mass migration on the scale that we do, mm. it's actually not going to solve the problem because we will only be catching up to the demands that we're already bringing in. Mm. So we can have the policy of building new houses, which we do need to do, but if you're then just saying to anybody from around the world that can afford to buy a house, not even to live in, potentially as a speculative mm. asset, come and buy it, that doesn't solve the problem either. There you go. Uh, let's have a look at this story, if I may, Rebecca Jane, in oh. the Sunday Times. Widely prescribed anti-anxiety drug linked to hundreds of deaths. Uh, this is a powerful medication widely prescribed for anxiety. Behind the fastest rising death toll of any drug in the UK, this is an according to an exclusive investigation by the Sunday Times, doctors and coroners have raised concerns about... Uh, uh, I, I, Dablin. Oh, thank you. Well done for saying. You helped me out. That's a bit fuzzy. <laughs> Highly addictive. Uh, 8.6 million prescriptions in England in 2022. Um, do you think that these anti-anxiety drugs, antidepressant drugs, do more harm than good? Um, I'm not a fan on antidepressants. I do think that they've got a place, though. Obviously, the lady we had on earlier, she really wound me up. Right. Now, was this was uh, Be Beverly, Beverly Thompson. I was sat here absolutely livid. Um, because antidepressants do have a place, and you're talking to somebody who was addicted to them for 18 months. Mm. I'd been on them for five years. It took me 18 months to come off them, so I don't recommend them for myself. However, they absolutely have a place for people. Did they help you at the beginning? Yeah, and I, I don't think I'd be here if it hadn't been for them, mm. because as much as they... You know, antidepressants are there to numb you and not to feel any emotion or anything at all. And that's not a good thing because that's only going to help you to get better for a very short space of time. You really need to kind of go through it to understand why you are the way mm. that you are. There's a lot of people who need to feel that numbness for a period of time because they are at so much distress. And what really concerned me was when she said that, you know, what would you say to somebody who was struggling and give it time? Oh, my goodness, I was so angry because I deal with so many people who are suicidal in, in my, obviously, mental health clinic. Mm. If you That's tell nice. somebody who's at the absolute depths of despair, give it time, and within a year, things will be better, nobody wants to hear that when you're at absolute crisis point. So... Don't give it time. Go straight to your GP. I don't... Well, and again, I don't really advocate for the NHS services. What would you say? Samaritans, what would you do? No... I actually think that the best thing you can do is to try and help yourself educate research, education and all the rest of it. I do think that antidepressants have a place. If you are at that depth of despair, I think they can be an absolute lifeline and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. But, above all else, I think the one thing that helped me was education and a different type of therapy. Benedict, I hear everything that Rebecca had to say with respect and sympathy. However, you do wonder whether the NHS dole out these antidepressant medications, anti-anxiety drugs, like they are smarties. They do, uh, they do. and they, the, the problem is that we treat medication as sort of a one-size-fits-all thing, whereas mm. actually every human being is different and will react in different ways to different psychoactive substances, which is what, you know, they are designed to affect your head yeah. and, your, and your nervous system and your hormones and the chemical balances in your body. Mm. That is not necessarily going to respond the same way for everybody. The doses are not necessarily going to work for everybody. People are on them for too long. It is very true that people can become very dependent mm. on them. Uh, one thing that has not not necessarily been addressed but needs to be increasingly is uh, the, 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 the capability of these things if you're on them too long to cause psychosis if you come off them too quickly. True. Uh, that is something that is not addressed. But actually, what really concerns me is that we are now, as you say, we're, we're in a position now where the NHS just doles mm -hmm. them out because we're told we're in a mental health crisis. That's not normal. And Actually, this is not normal it. at Including all. Including children and teenagers. Yeah, this, this, the level of mental ill health in this mm. country is not normal, mm. and we should no. be looking to address the causes but of it. You should be looking to create healthy, mentally healthy and robust children and adults mm. rather than waiting for them to hit a crisis point and then go, mm. pills, big pills, well, don't, fantastic. Don't, don't you think that the... NHS or, or us, we're doling out these pills because it's actually cheaper than the alternative. They which make I money, don't think Lisa. It is. Well, I, I don't know. Well, the, it pharmaceutical, is the pharmaceutical companies do. But well, 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 building strong, resilient communities and Take, people takes, more takes money, resources, and it's easy I to get right. time. It right. does, but I think that that's such a problem with this country is the de the, the lack of long term um, planning, of planning mm. because that is more expensive in the long term, and we're yeah. seeing this right now with the 
economic crisis that we're hitting. Had we addressed some of this earlier on, it wouldn't be costing us quite so much. I think it's the exact same thing with this. I think it might be cheap in the short term to dole mm. out pills, but actually I think long term you could save an awful lot of people and therefore by extension a lot of working hours, a lot of all sorts of things, a lot of NHS resources would be saved. It's not simply the cost of the pill that we're talking about. I mean, about listen, here. what about a bit of tough love, uh, Lisa? Are there people, young people at school who have been told that if they're just having a tough day, that that's an illness, and that actually younger people, you mentioned sort of r being robust. Mm. Do we need to teach young people to be more resilient? Let's not forget that in the Second World War, German bombs were raining over Liverpool, yeah. Coventry, Birmingham and London. Uh, people didn't have pills to pop, they got on with it. I, I've got a lot of sympathy, though, with the younger generation, because if there's one thing that I didn't have growing up was social media constantly telling me mm. it, that I was wrong or I was right or, or that I was, you're ugly or yeah, that you're beautiful. Yeah, and the, that sort of level of, you know, being bullied at school, you were at school, being bullied now, you can be sat at home oh, with yeah. it constantly coming through. So I do have some sympathy for young people and their mental health. I think that the, the social media is not helping anybody, actually. But don't you think education will be the way? So, so a youngster is, is, is struggling. And actually the teacher and, and perhaps, I don't know, a faith leader or, or a family friend just sits them down and just says, look, uh, you know, life is difficult and you're going to have to navigate do your way through this. Do we have those communities anymore, though? Do you know? Do, do no, some, not some, quite. Some and yeah. it's not just about resilience. Yes, our kids are not as resilient as what they need to be, but it's about that nobody ever teaches adults, let alone children, how to understand themselves, hmm. why they are the way that they are, why they have the beliefs that they are. That's the thing that fixed me after, you know, God knows how many years of mental illness. And actually, if we start younger and teach kids that stuff and actually ask them what would help you with your mental health, we probably wouldn't have the mental health crisis that we've got. Okay, well, look, uh, folks, uh, lots more to get through. More papers to come, more front pages, and my pundits will nominate their headline heroes and back page zeros. Plus, are you addicted to mayonnaise? See you in two. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. We're always told that there is a, a huge need for care workers in Britain. We're always told that the salaries just aren't big enough against the benefit system for British people to want to do that work. And, and there probably is some real truth in that. Uh, and yet, if up to 25% of those that come are acting illegally, and it would seem up until now, uh, that in some areas, foreign care workers come in, but bring in almost the same number of family members with them, that we need to have a proper debate about this. I'm very pleased to be joined by Mike Padgham, chair of the Independent Care Group. If I accept those arguments for a moment, how can it be that the system is so lax that up to 25 per cent are found by the inspector of borders and immigration to be working illegally. Well, good evening to you, Nigel. It's good to join you. I mean, those figures are shocking to me. When I looked at it um, today, when I saw that uh, 275 visas had been issued to a care home that didn't even exist, and uh, a further over a thousand people joined a company that only had uh, previously four staff in it, it makes me wonder. The bureaucracy of the Home Office didn't think to check that these companies exist in the first place because it should be quite straightforward. If people are providing care, they're regulated by the Care Quality Commission. It's a simple phone call to check and double check. Sadly, there seems to have been very many loopholes at the beginning. I believe that's been tight now, but I can't understand it because all the providers that are doing it in the proper way have to go through quite a, a, a rigmarole to actually get approved and it takes months. So it, it beggars belief that this has happened and people have, have, have been approved for a company that doesn't even exist. I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out.
With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the show. Uh, let's have a look at some front pages. And we start with the Mirror. Sunday Mirror, a secret papers to be released. Andrew faces fresh court bombshell. Sunday Times, Chancellor in last-ditch fight to cut tax by 2p. And winning together, there you go, Jerry Halliwell and Christian Horner reunited with a public display of affection following allegations and rumours that he was sending suggestive texts to a female colleague, allegations which he denies. Sunday Express, cut tax or lose grey votes. And most importantly, Daily Star Sunday, my name's Megan and I'm a mayo-holic. Boring Belgians famously love to dip their chips in mayonnaise, but Brit's Megan Tompkins is so addicted to the bottled gloop, she smothers all her food in it, including curries and porridge. She gets through three bottles a week. Uh, so does Lisa McKenzie, but not mayonnaise. Uh, Lisa uh... McKenzie is with me, <laughs> who is, of course, one of my top pundits. We also have Benedict Spence, Pope Benedict, and the one and only, our very fabulous Rebecca Jane. Uh, Rebecca Jane, do you uh, are you a mayonnaise addict? I mean, I'm not putting it on my porridge, but I am really disappointed that there is not one producer here who hasn't ran out, got <laughs> porridge, and put mayonnaise in well, it. Well, mm. if only. I mean, I tell you, uh, Maria, remember that for next time. <laughs> uh, Benedict, do you enjoy a, a splash of the white stuff on your bread? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yes. No, <laughs> can't do that. Well, can I say? Do you know what? <laughs> it's only for obscene sewer-like minds. That's just gone right. It's like being back at it. school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. Why not mayonnaise? When I would say going to Belgium is it is an experience, isn't it? To have chips uh, with mayonnaise uh, uh, in Belgium, uh, along with waffles and everything else they have. That I've, I've managed to reduce the tone back down. Well, well something rather wholesome. <laughs> salad. What, what in the big debate of salad cream and mayonnaise? What oh, is that? No. Salad, salad cream's no. Salad cream and... and no, no, salad cream's got more flavour, so it, it, it punches through in a sandwich. It's it the, does. It's the texture. It's, is that right? It's the same, isn't but, it? But I, I, I mean, I'm not a wildly religious person, but if there is a devil, he invented mayonnaise. Because, I mean, it is just pure calories, isn't mm. it? It's just solid oil. It's not good for you, but it tastes pretty good. Yeah, yeah. but I, I'm thinking more of the salad cream now. Summer, summer salad, bit right? of salad cream you on the edge. You're, you're old school. I like yeah. it. You're keeping it real, yeah, Lisa McKenzie. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Okay. Uh, well, listen. Uh, <laughs> listen. It is uh, a very good time yeah. to go through your nominations for headline hero and back page zero of the day. Rebecca Jane, who is your hero today? Nobody. Just that's how bad <laughs> things are. Yeah, I could not give. Two monkeys. Not even the mayonnaise person. Absolutely nobody. Well, because... I don't know, Keir Starmer, he's going to make Britain great again. Uh, Stop it. OK. Rishi uh, Sunak, I'll leadership on extremism? No, he, he every single week I could vote okay, for okay. zero. All right, um, Prince Andrew, time to forgive and forget. Is he your hero? <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah, reaching. It's about time he went to live on a you, farm. Can you help <laughs> Rebecca Jane with some ideas for who her hero is? Awful. I the, I'll tell you what I've really enjoyed this week. The uh, Willy Wonka experience. Um, so, wait, they're, they're, are they a winner? Or? <laughs> this was a disastrous yes. live event. I think the <laughs> Scottish grannies, who's been, like, really having a go at these people. I, I mean, know. I was going to say, yeah. the only person who's, like, had a big week that's gone well is George Galloway, but I'm not sure he's a oh, hero, Oh, we can't is he? nominate him. Well, but, 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 he's done hey, hey, everyone, everyone loves a winner. Well, there you go. <laughs> some people love him, some people don't like him, including the Prime Minister. OK, well, look, if you've got time, drop me an email. Who do you think should be Rebecca Jane's yeah. hero Help of me the day? Out. Headline hero she needs. Who's your hero today? <laughs> uh, let's power through. Um, who is your hero today, Benedict? Uh, mine's mine's Jaden Dans. Jaden Dance, do you know oh, who that is? Footballer. No. He's a footballer. He's an 18-year-old Liverpool footballer who oh, yeah. uh, last Wednesday made his debut uh, against uh, Luton for the last few minutes and then came on in the League Cup final uh, for a few minutes at the end and won, uh, which means that in about 28 minutes he's got more career trophies than Harry Kane does. Well, it's not that big. Uh, and, th and, then, and then this week he went out and he scored two against Southampton in the FA Cup. 18 years old, remember the name, he's having a great old time and I think he's going to be very good. This is how much we're scraping the yeah. barrel. 
Yeah, I, but it's I've better got, than nobody, though, isn't I've got, it? A really good, I've got a really good one. She's from my hometown, Nottingham, Vicky McClure, yeah. who is leading a campaign to save mm -hmm. the arts in Nottingham. Mm -hmm. Brilliant actress and a great artist. Uh, brilliant stuff. OK, uh, how about your back page zero? You're not, you're not oh. lacking a few of them, are you? Oh, no, so I've Apparently got two. everybody has a zero. I had, oh, yeah, absolutely. I've got two for you. I've done a joint nomination. It's Good. Jerry and her husband, Christian Horner, because he's a donkey for the ridiculous <laughs> messages that were very uninspiring. Which, not which, which, he, which he categorically denies. He, categor <laughs> he can categorically deny all he wants. I've made my mind up. Um, and Jerry, because, well, she was just been an embarrassment today. OK. Uh, Richard is suggesting that he should... That you Ugh. should be... Richard has said herself for being a great panellist. You oh, are Richard's you, Richard. hero tonight. Um, back page zero, Benedict. Having said that everyone loves a winner, it is George Galloway. Because <laughs> I just kind of feel like we should yeah. be beyond that stage of British politics. But, hey, we've got a Prime Minister name-dropping Nick Griffin at the dispatch box outside Hello. number 10. 2008 is back with a vengeance. It's it like really it never is. went away. It really it's is. It's depressing. OK, uh, very briefly, if you can. Just Nottingham City Council, we are bankrupt. <laughs> we are bankrupt. Uh, they are getting rid of parks and they're getting rid of all arts and culture. Not good. Uh, thank you to my brilliant pundits tonight. Love your company. Love your company at home, listening on the radio, watching on telly. I'm back tomorrow at 9. A great one from Wendy. A hero would be Dave Myers, of course. The brilliant oh, uh, hairy biker sadly passed oh, away yeah, this week. Yeah. And John says Lee Anderson for saying it how it is. I did do uh, Listen, I will see you tomorrow at nine. And uh, do stay tuned. Headliners is next. And tomorrow night, it's The Big Opinion. It's my take at ten and much more. Thanks to Maria and the team for a great job tonight. Bye for now. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello there, I'm Greg Dewhurst and welcome to your latest GB News weather. It's going to be quite chilly tonight, some frost and fog and some icy stretches around, but Sunday should be drier and brighter. We currently have low pressure in charge of our weather, but it does start to move away through Sunday allowing a drier day before then further wet and windy weather spreads in from the west for Monday. So this evening time we do have outbreaks of showery rain, sleet and some hill snow across northern England spreading into Scotland, parts of Northern Ireland and some western fringes of Wales too. Elsewhere we'll see some clear spells and as temperatures drop overnight we'll see some mist and fog patches forming, some icy stretches too, temperatures in the countryside minus 2 to minus 5 Celsius. So could be some tricky travelling conditions across central southern parts of England first thing, dense fog patches but they slowly lift and break and then for most it's a bright and cheery day, plenty of sunny spells, a scattering of showers across western parts of the UK and this weather front close to the east could give some patchy rain along the east coast. Temperatures up a little bit compared to Saturday, a bit more brightness around. It will just feel a little less cold. Then into Monday, this weather system starts to move into western areas, bringing some outbreaks of heavy rain and brisk winds too. Elsewhere, a cold, frosty start, but then plenty of sunshine across the north and the east through the day, and temperatures a little higher once more. It remains mixed Tuesday and towards the middle of the week, but temperatures a little above average. See you soon. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Is a debate on gender really a far right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase. You know what I mean? Like anyone who talks about anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right because that's what that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is of course about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before,
but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her uh, touching her zip because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's, she's making that symbol. Yeah, but when she, she wasn't making the symbol, wow. she was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And and all, also, this isn't a far-right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly... Yeah. I mean, well, this she's, is she's, she's, Wait, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far-right. But also, I mean... even if she were right-wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an, one of the most important issues of our day. What well, are Labour playing out here? they're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say, I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if no, you they say won't. that, will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <laughs> I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel.